Hi everyone, my name is, is Kevin Byrne. I'm the Consul General here at the Irish Consulate in Chicago covering the, the Midwest. Uh, we're delighted you can join us uh, this morning. Um, uh, it's going to be a great uh, conversation. Uh, we've just had a, a little pre-chat before we got going and I think you're in for, for a real treat. Um, we're really delighted to have the opportunity to, to share this conversation with our community partners here in the Midwest um, and with uh, our partners in, in EI Enterprise Ireland and the IDA. Um, we're so thankful to Podrick uh, and his team for giving us his time. Uh, it's only five months now to, to the Ryder Cup, so uh, we know that um, all the preparation is, is um, you know, it's coming up, so we're, we're really delighted to him for, for his time. Um, obviously, we're coming uh, to this at the end of, of a difficult year or more than difficult year uh, for our community organisations. So much of what our organisations do is, is bring people together. And of course, in the pandemic, that hasn't been possible. Um, but one thing that we have seen here in the consulate is that golf has been the opportunity for people uh, to come together, either be it for fundraisers or, or for socials. So um, golf has definitely brought uh, many of our organizations through uh, this, this difficult year. Really quick overview of how uh, we'll run the event. Um, I'll hand over very, uh, very shortly to, to the ambassador and to Podrick. Um, they'll go into um, their, their conversation. Um, and there's a Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask, just pop them into the Q&A uh, and the ambassador and, and Podrick will see those. So they'll be, they'll be uh, integrated into the conversation as and when we go. We'll try and get you uh, to, to your desk so you're, while well, you're at your desk, but we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up um, just on the hour so that you can uh, get your days uh, started. Um, so without further ado, I'll just make some, some quick introductions. Um, obviously, both our speakers don't really need uh, introduction, that they're well known to, to, to all of us, but uh, Bodrick Harrington was born in Dublin. Uh, he's a proud family man, married to Caroline with two children, Patrick and Kieran. Uh, following a very successful amateur career, including three Walker Cup appearances, he turned professional in September 1995. Uh, as a three-time major champion and six-time Ryder Cup player, Bodrick's playing record really speaks for itself. Uh, whilst, of course, later this year, he will be the captain uh, of the European Ryder Cup team at Whistling Straits, just north of us in, in Wisconsin. And then speaking today will be uh, Ambassador Dan Mulhall, uh, a Waterford man who took up duty uh, as Ireland's 18th ambassador to the US in August of 2017. Uh, he's an uh, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, studies in uh, UCC, where he specialised in modern Irish history. Uh, over his 40-year career in the department, he served in New Delhi, Vienna, uh, the European Union, Edinburgh, and as Ireland's ambassador to Malaysia um, and to London. Mitt has a keen interest in Irish history and literature, uh, and as you'll hear from the discussion this morning, he's also a very keen golfer. Um, the session is being recorded uh, today, um, and again, you can pop your questions uh, into the chat. I really hope you enjoy the discussion today. Audrey and, and Ambassador, over to you both. Well, thank you, Kevin, and uh, welcome, Padraig. It's great to uh, see you again. Uh, we first met in Malaysia many years ago when I was the ambassador there, and you were uh, a very uh, loyal um, uh, attender at the Malaysian Open, where I believe every year in those days you started your year, your playing year, by playing in the Malaysian Open. And it was a great pleasure for me to play in a couple of pro-ams. I never got a chance to play with you. You were usually playing with the king, whereas I, I ended up playing with uh, some other golfers. Uh, but it was really an enjoyable experience. And you were a great ambassador for Ireland at that time. And you have been a great ambassador to Ireland ever since. And you continue to be uh, one of our leading uh, lights in uh, world sport. Uh, Pori will be too modest, of course, to uh, say something like this. But, I, but I'm going to say it now, that Pori Harrington is probably Ireland's greatest ever individual sportsman. I'm not going to compare him with the hurlers and the Gaelic footballers who play a team game. Boric plays a game for individuals. And I have the view that you can find any other Irish person in, you know, the last hundred years of, you know, professional sport, the professional sports era uh, that can uh, uh, compare with Boric Harrington in terms of his achievements, you know. Three majors. And by the way, I checked this. And I'll tell you all now uh, that... There are only 30 golfers in the history of the game who have won more than three majors. So in terms of, of the game of golf, if you judge it on the basis of major wins, Porik is in the top 40 golfers who ever played this game. Extraordinary achievement. And we'll, we'll get into a conversation now shortly about how that happened. And, and he'll maybe explain to us what the, what the secret of his success is. Um, 
because I know it'll be fascinating for all of us to, to get that insight. And um, he's had 31 uh, tournament victories in all. As Kevin said, six Ryder Cups and now going to be the captain of the Ryder Cup in Whistling Straits between the 24th and the 26th of September. I hope to be there for that. I haven't been to Wisconsin yet. It would be a great way to make my first visit to Wisconsin to see an Irishman uh, lead Europe to, to, a, to, to another Ryder Cup victory. So, um, Porrick, um, can we start at the beginning? I actually have played Stackstown Golf Club many times. In fact, I, my first visit there many years ago, I met your late father, who was a stalwart of, of the club. But, uh, and I know it's, it's, and it's interesting to me that, that, you know, the two golfers from our part of Ireland who've won majors, yourself and Shane Lowry, you didn't come from Port Marnock or Royal Dublin or any of the, the kind of, you know, the courses that you hear listed uh, in the kind of list of the greatest Irish golf courses. Stackstown in your case, and I think Esker, I think Esker Hill is in Shane Lowry's case, yeah? So tell me about, I mean, when did it when did it strike you? Was it a sort of a moment, like a, like a road to Damascus moment, when you suddenly realized, hey, I could become a professional golfer, or how did it? How did you get to the stage where you you believed you could actually make it in professional golf? Okay, thank what you, Dan. Moment? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dan, and uh, welcome to everybody. I, Dan, you just mentioned there first of all that you're going to go to the Ryder Cup. Yeah, uh, there is there is a little payback for everybody who's listening to this. You all have to go to the Ryder Cup and make the noise of at least. Three people when you're there, okay? So you've got to be, ex we need as much support as we can get. So everybody watching this, that's the payback. Okay, as regards me becoming a, a pro, I never really thought I was going to become a pro. Uh, I, and on a wider scheme, I'll just say about most athletes, sports people, do not come from a, a life of privilege. Obviously, to become a sports person or successful like that, you have to really only have one option. You have to be focused. You've got to be committed. If you come from a more affluent background, well, clearly you can always go get a job or you can move on or you can do something else. So it's much better. Usually with golf, it would be a middle-class background because obviously not too many of the of, uh, of poor background would have access to golf. But generally, all sports people, you've got a better chance of making it if you've got nothing else that you can do. Uh, in my case, I was like every other kid. I played sport. Uh, loved sport. I played daily football, played hurling. Uh, I played soccer. I played, I played everything. Everything I could get hold of. It just happened that 13, 14 years of age, I had the option of playing in goals and letting two or three goals in on the weekend or playing golf and winning. So... It wasn't that I loved golf more than football. I just was having success. So golf became my sport. 18 years of age, I was like every kid, didn't know what I wanted to do. I went, when I, one of my brothers who was an accountant brought me down and rolled me in the technical uh, uh, college for like 150 euros. It cost to go to my first year in college uh, to do accountancy. I spent five years doing that. And halfway through it, I decided I would turn pro at the end of it because I was able to beat the other amateurs who were turning pro, not because I thought I was good enough. So my whole idea was maybe play five years on the tour as a journeyman pro and then come back and manage, uh, you know, a nice golf course or, you know, be a golf course professional manager, that type of thing. Uh, but I was good. I didn't know I was. And, and probably the greatest part of my success is... I just did it. I played. I, I played like I had blinkers. I didn't look around me. I didn't overthink it. I, I had a lot of fear. Uh, I was very much motivated by this could all go away tomorrow. And I, I'd get up every day. I'd be excited and I'd be fearful. I'd work hard because of that fear. Uh, it I took me, I was probably 12 years of professional before I'd come through my winter break and not be scared that it would be all gone away. Uh, so that, that, that fear... I know they say don't work with fear, but that fear worked very well with me. It dro drove me. And, and I, I didn't question myself. You know, I, I, as an experienced guy now, I look back and I wonder, I, I'm glad I don't know. I'm glad I didn't know then what I know now because I would have second-guessed myself. I would have doubted it. And, and I, unfortunately, I see the young guys coming out now and it's, uh, it's a lot harder now for the young fellas coming out. There, there's some beautiful, talented golfers coming playing golf, both in the US and in Ireland. And 
the pressure, the stress, the depth is so strong that they just second guess themselves. They lose their way, second guess themselves. And, and golf is, is there's such a minute difference between the best and the worst uh, that, you know, any doubt and they're gone. And, and you know, in Ireland, we're talking about that. We produce a lot of major winners, but we're having a bit of a lull at the moment. Uh, Bar Leona McGuire and Stephanie Meadows, we don't have too many male pros coming out at the moment and they're wondering why but it's, it's just it's very deep and if you don't have that insular self-confidence it's very hard to be successful and luckily nobody told me I couldn't do it and that was probably the greatest thing in my life I never realized I couldn't go out and win I never realized that I wasn't meant to win majors and uh, so I I just did it without without that uh, it's not that I didn't have fear, but I didn't have the thought that, you know, that I wasn't allowed to do it. And that, that's probably the best thing I ever had. Yeah. I mean, I'm a typical, like, you know, weekend golfer. Like, I I, uh, I play about 10 or 12 times a year. That's probably it. Because yeah, 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 right. We believe that, don't I'm we? Busy otherwise, I'm busy <laughs> otherwise. But, uh, but, uh, I, but, I, but, I, but I am playing this weekend. And what I can say is that, like a lot of people on this call, a lot of people who, who, who play golf, you know, I mean, I can crush a drive down the middle of the fairway. I can... I can hit a, you know, a long iron well. I can I, I I can chip well, but I'm still uh, a scratchy golfer rather than a scratch golfer, right? Because there's something missing. I I don't have no. So my, my so my question is like, what is it that makes the golfer like you know? I I played recently a couple of years ago with a, with a kid from Wake Forest, and he was brilliant. Like he he was he caddied for us for the first nine, and then the back nine is uh, the guy he was caddying for went off, and we said, "Why don't you join us?" And he, and he played the back nine, and he played it three under par, right? And he told me he was only the second best golfer at Wake Forest at that time, right? Now that kid probably won't make it, even though he played three under par for nine holes, right? So what is it that what is that quality? I mean, is it like is it between the two ears? Is it a game of the mind? Is it sort of you know, um, a head rather than hand? Is it mind rather than muscle? I mean, what is the what is the secret sauce that allows people to make that great from being an excellent amateur golfer, from being a superb university golfer, college player, to getting onto the circuit and winning, you know, winning tournaments? It, 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 is, it is absolutely their belief. And it's a deep down belief. You know, it's right down in their soul what they actually believe, where they stand. And even for you, uh, not for a beginner golfer it's not it's all physical and and but once you get playing for a few years we could turn around and improve your driving we could substantially improve your chipping we could improve parts of your game yet you'll actually end up being the same handicapped golfer because somewhere inside you I, i'm not sure what handicap you play off dan 18 say let's say 18. So, yeah so somewhere down inside you you believe that that's where you're set. And it's very hard to change that after a while. Even if we improved you as a player, you're yeah. kind of stuck into figuring it. You'll always find a way of playing to 18 over par, yeah, yeah, Even, yeah. whether you play good or bad. In, in, in over the course. And pros are very much like that. You can go to, and, 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 and this is not seen enough. You could go out on tour and I'll find you 20 players, at least maybe 50 players that are relatively poor ball strikers who are very good, Tour, they're on PGA Tour. They're obviously very good players and they're relatively poor. They're not great at hitting the golf ball, but they can get it done. And like that, I can find you thousands of players in every golf club that physically hit the golf ball better than pros, but their mindset has them has been five handicap or something. It's just just the nature of the game. So it, the physical side is only a very small component, even though because it's measured. You can measure how many fairways you hit. You can measure how far you hit it. It's easier for coaches to focus on it. It's easier to, to, to think that that's the answer. And, and every kid I come across will tell you that, you know, I, I get sucked into it myself. I work on my technique tirelessly. But to be honest, what really sets you apart is how well you work on the mental game, the competitive side, uh, and, 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 and just that mindset of where you believe you belong. Like, you know, People listening in here or working in business, you know, you've come across people that, you know, you wonder, you know, are, are they that, are they, they're not the most intelligent person you've come across yet. They're tremendously successful in business. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times it's because they believe it. They believe that they should do that. And any knockback they get doesn't bother them. They keep going forward. They don't see anything like that. Whereas you, you've come across great people who just can't seem to get a break. 
and, and unfortunately that's it's something deep down inside us and it's very hard to change the soul and and that lad at Wake Forest you know those kids come up to me not that particular kid but kids come up to me all the time and if they tell me that how many balls they're hitting a day or how many hours they're practicing it nearly switches the switch off in my head so if to sum this up and some of you hopefully will have kids who are playing golf if you sent me out to watch the two best 16 year old golfers in your golf and they both went and you told me they were equally good they're the best and i went out and they both shot 66 the day i watched and you said well which one is the better player i would tell you the player who hit it in the trees all day and shot 66 is the better player not the player who hit the fairways and hit the greens the player who hit the fairways and hit the greens he'll have no imagination he he won't know what to do when things don't go right and they all at some stage on tour the amount of good players we see come out on tour and this this is very really good players and the tour just breaks them because everybody in the tour hits between 65 and 75 percent of fairways and, and and greens. So, if you're a really good player, how do you how do you rationalise the ones you miss? Whereas if you're a, a like a like me who hits it a bit crooked at times, when I miss a fairway, ah sure I miss fairways. I get on with it. Whereas a, a really good ball striker, he misses a fairway. He thinks there's <clears throat> there's something wrong with him. So yeah, it's it's. It is a mental game, ultimately, for the pro. And even for anybody who's played for a while, I, I've seen it because we could improve your game. And, and yet you'll tell, I, I have put up on YouTube, on Instagram, on my website, on Twitter, everything I know about golf. So there's a lesson there that will help you improve that. OK, I guarantee it. Thank you. Thank you. But you, yeah, but I could, I could give you that lesson and I'll come back to you in a year. And you'll still be at 18 bloody handicap. And, I'm, you know, so it, it is, it, we just seem to set ourselves in, in a certain position or mindset. I will say, if we really wanted to improve, right, we would send you out there every week in a game that you cared about. So I'm not suggesting you gamble, but that's how I, I would have gambled in my club growing up. So we played for a Coke, a plate of chips. There was always something on the line. Actually, and with a, actually with in, Malaysia, line, down, in Malaysia, I got down to 13 because we used to have, you know, a, a bet, a $5 bet for, for a game, you know, five on the front nine, five on the back nine. And all these Chinese guys, all these Malays, they're all big into betting on golf, as you know. And, yeah. uh, and, and that was my I'm, best thought. So you're right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised you're only paying for a fiver with, with, the, with these guys. But <laughs> if you are competing, you will figure a way to get it done. Yeah, so yeah. The, I would suspect with your game, Dan, that when you go to play, that you're more interested in feeling hitting good shots and, and feeling like a player than the result. Whereas if you're interested in the result, you'd be better than an 18 handicap. And, and, and also, like, like, like I regard golf as a good walk enhanced. In other words, I, I, I talk to people all the time. We have a good chat. I tell them about Ireland. If they're, if they're not, if they're Americans, ask them about Ireland. I talk about Irish golf, or golf courses and so on. So, I mean, I, I'm actually, to some extent, I'm, I'm not saying I'm doing work, but I'm sort of, I'm at least I'm, I'm, I'm not focusing 100% on, on, on the next shot. I'm actually, you know, I, I take a shot sort of in between my conversation that goes on the whole, the whole round, you know, and, and that's yeah. the way it is, you know, with, with players like me. But can I ask you about, about, about you know, majors? Like, I mean, like, I spent my childhood, um, you know, watching the British Open every year. That was the only only golf um, tournament that was shown on TV. It was shown live every year. And in those days, Christy O'Connor Sr. was the, the kind of leading Irish golfer, right? And Christy, every, every year he was competitive. He never quite uh, made it. Now, you became the first person from our part of Ireland uh, to win a major. I mean, is it, I mean, is it something, is it nerve? Because I remember watching on, on television... You are on the 17th fairway at, at Royal Birkdale. I think it was 2008. And you decided to go for the green. And you got an eagle, right? But I, you know, but I remember thinking, oh, why doesn't he lay up? He, he's a couple of shots ahead. What's he, what's he doing this mad thing for? Why doesn't he just lay the ball up and, 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 and take a birdie, you know? So is, well, that, is, I mean, is that the quality you need to win a major? <clears throat> yes, and, and ab absolutely. But there's a lot goes into it before that I think uh, on that particular shot it was the 71st hole at Birkdale yep. uh, my old coach used to say this and it's very true so that's the best shot I've ever hit in my life yeah. but my old coach used to say it's easy to hit a great shot when you're feeling great 
it's really difficult to hit an okay shot when you're feeling bad. And I was feeling great. So I, I, I took the shot on because I, I knew I was in a good place and feeling good. If I wasn't feeling good at that moment, I would have played a conservative shot. Whereas when things are going for you, you've got to double down and go after it because ultimately that's when you, you can win it then rather than leaving it up to other people. So that's why I took that shot on as an individual. As regards winning majors, Dermot Gleese kind of summed this up and we, we have alluded to it already. So he was interviewing Eamon Darcy, who had been leading one of the Opens at one stage. It might have been Chris O'Connor Jr. And he was talking to him afterwards. And he says, well, you know, you, you had the lead. What happened? And he played well all the week. And, he, and Eamon said, but I'm not meant to win a major. So there was this, maybe because Chris O'Connor Sr. didn't win one. And he was our, he's probably our greatest, physically probably our greatest golfer ever. And he didn't win one. So we weren't meant to win one from a little small island like this. That was reserved for other people. But I didn't have that burden. Whatever it was, being the youngest of five boys, my dad was a policeman. Uh, you, know, uh, we, you know, we grew up a normal policeman. Like, I, I would suggest, we, like, I'm, I'm sure things were tight in my house in terms of money and stuff like that. But I thought I was rich growing up. I, I had everything I wanted. You know, I, 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 because I didn't want everything, I had everything I wanted. So, and that carried on into my golf. I just, I just was, there was nothing that would hold me back because I, I, I didn't think there was. Uh, I didn't overthink it. Now, the specifics of getting the actual majors, it took years for me to get my head around handling the pressure. So, it's a very simple thing for anybody here who's into, into golf. So, when you practice your golf, it's a very technical thing, which would be your left brain. So it's it's conscious. You're you you're it's mathematical. Every all that computing computing is going on in your left brain. But when you play something and you get in the zone, it's all right brain. So you you know you're intuitive on that. So the big key, and this is what I'm talking about, doing the right practice is three weeks before a major, I would stop every bit of technical work and only go into the intuitive stuff. And it would take me three weeks to quiet my brain down. So instead of being on the golf course thinking, what's this feel like? What's this doing? What's that? After about three weeks, because it's not a light switch, you can't just go, I'm going to be just thinking where I'm going or my target. It took a good while. And it took, I probably perfected it over three, four, five years with, with Bob Rattel, my He's my sports psychologist in the States. And eventually I had a good system that I could quiet my mind down. Uh, and believe it, even as I say it to you here, I don't do it enough. Even though I know it works, I, it's a lot easier to do as I say, not as I do. Uh, but I did for those major wins and I got in the zone. And I didn't play perfect golf in those tournaments. Uh, there was plenty of shots, good and bad. Uh, I had several other tournaments where I had a chance of winning. Uh, so, like, even in 2006, I had a chance of winning the U.S. Open at Wingsfoot. Three pars would have won it for me. And that was the famous one where Phil Mickelson took double down the last Monty bogey the last. I bogeyed the last three holes to lose that. Yeah. By, I think I lost by, I was two shots out. So, I had to put in the last to get in the playoff. And, but I was learning that, hang on a second, I can do, if I keep doing my stuff, and, and this is ultimately what it's about. If you believe what you do is good enough, then you're just relentless at doing it. Every day, just do your stuff. The day you think you need more, that you need something else to do something for you, the day you believe, and it doesn't mean that I wasn't trying to get better, but I was very good at, at, at just, okay, I, I would learn from others, bring it into me, but I was very good at, at doing my stuff and not caring, not caring how fancy it looked, not care, just caring about the results and getting the job done. And, and, yeah, it with the different preparations that it led to three majors in quick succession, which is kind of it would have been a lot easier for my golfing life if I won the majors in 2005, 2010, and 2015. <laughs> you know, the fact that they came so quick, people think that it was like it was a golden period, but I actually played better golf in 2009 and 2010. Uh, I just didn't win tournaments. Yeah. It's amazing. It's an. Uh, I actually, the year I won the two majors, I was struggling. I didn't play well at all in 2008 for the first six months. So it, golf is strange that way. People like to sport, like to see results and want the black and white. But 
it takes a long while building up. I, it was coming, but it was very much me just doing my thing. You know, to, to, to sort of, to, to kind of, you know, I draw my own experience of my own uh, career is that, you know, if I had a choice between the most brilliant colleague in the Department of Foreign Affairs and someone who, who displayed what I call the three Ps, patience, perseverance, persistence, I take the second one because I, I actually believe that those qualities are more valuable in, in my uh, work, you know, than the guy that has the, or the person that has the brilliance. It may not, yeah. may not be able to always apply that brilliance to, because you have to be an all-rounder. And the same, I, I guess, is true in golf. You have to be good at, at all kinds of things, at driving, chipping, you know, long arms, putting. And, and if you're brilliant, maybe maybe that isn't the best recipe. But anyway, can we move on to the Ryder Cup? No, no, I, 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 it is my, my original coach in Ireland, so the national coach would be my first coach in 50. Yeah. He had all the mnemonics and acronyms like that, the three Ps. And I yeah. just laugh him because you were bringing it back to me, all the little. Uh, he was very much, he, he, as a golf coach, so my coach from, in my formative years was not as much into the golf swing as he was into the personality of how, of how you play golf. Right, yeah. Could I just turn the clock forward to the Ryder Cup that's coming up? I mean, you know, I've played team games. I played a bit of rugby, played a bit of hurling, played a bit of soccer, you know, and I understand how you motivate teams. You know, I can imagine Paul O'Connell in the dressing room in an Ireland rugby game at halftime roaring at the, at the guys, let's get out there, let's get stuck in, you know, and, and you know, the same is true, you know, Johnny Sexton, you know, you know, we know that there are people in, you know, and managers can sort of, you know, really kind of work, you know, work people up. But that's the case in kind of team games where you can have a huddle before the game and you can, you can, you can psych each other up and you go into battle. But, but what is it? I mean, golf is the ultimate individual game, isn't it? I mean, apart from boxing, I can't think of any other game that's so much dependent on your individual skills against the course and against the other players that are, that, that are, that are playing the tournament. So how do you go about, or how do you intend to go about motivating, uh, you know, players for this very unusual team game in a game that is normally played by individuals who are in their own zone all the time and, and rarely have to worry about any kind of, uh, you know, collective element? Well, I'm not a shouter. I will not be the guy in there shouting and roaring at them and, Cursing and bawling them out. Well, IT. Anyway. well no, uh, th 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 we have profiles of the players, and yeah. we know what ev we know what every player responds to in the team. Yeah. So I will have a player whose job will be to be a leader on the field. I will have a player whose job is to take a bit of that emotional uh, stuff into the locker room and and do that for me. So I will be asking, you know. I bring, bring to mind it's somebody like an Ian Poulter to do a bit of that, to get up there and do a bit of rousing for the, the crowds. Now, with the Ryder Cup, it's three days of, four days nearly of preparation, three days of competition. So you don't want guys to get too emotional, too burnt out early. Five rounds of golf is a lot in terms of, of emotional pressure hype. Ideally, nobody would play five rounds, but somebody would probably have to play five times. So it's a lot of stress. You don't want to get guys too hyped up. So there will be a lot of managing each player. Some players we know will burn themselves out once a day, so you can't play them twice. Uh, so it, it, it's understanding the different players. Now, the one big distinct thing, the players love the team environment because they're not used to it. So they really do love the older guys, especially the rookies add so much to it. They come in with enthusiasm. You've got an older guy who's a bit burned out. And the young guy, and he manages or minds that young guy, and it just just it's a great place the team. But the biggest issue is you get four matches of team environment. It's very exciting. It's fun. Okay, you have to drop four guys a session, and this is why the Ryder Cup differs to something like the Presidents Cup. It's not managing the eight guys that are on the field. It's managing the four guys who are not playing. Yeah. That's they're the hard ones to manage because you're saying. Well, you're not good enough to play. We're playing these eight guys. You're not playing like you're not, but you have to make sure that you manage those guys very well. So you've got four matches of team events, very exciting, buzz, everything. And then you have the singles and it gets so lonely in the singles because you don't have a playing partner. You, you, I cannot, first couple of matches are okay in the singles because the whole crowd follows the first, second, third, fourth match. You start getting down to the, I, I've played Ryder Cups where I've played like the, the 10th, 11th, 12th match. You get to the sixth hole. The only people will be watching you 
are your friends and family. And maybe even them aren't watching you. As in literally, there'll be 20 people at the green. Yeah, yeah. At a Ryder Cup, you can be playing a match and there's 20 people watching your match. Nobody cares if you're down there. But the problem is, when the crowds start turning up, all of a sudden they do care because your match counts. So you go from this big team environment of everybody's together to the most loneliest, feeling completely isolated, feeling completely out of it, completely like you don't count. Uh, I, I, but obviously that changes. If your match, if the TV cameras start coming back to you, if the crowds start coming back, as, as would have been 99 for me, I played Mark Amir, I think it was about seven, and nobody was interested in my match until my match made all the, looked like it would make all the difference whether we won or lost. Uh, so that would be up in Brookline and Boston, not too far away there. So some of you would have been at that. And it just might, the crowd swelled at my match, like they were 20 deep and shouting and roaring, especially at Mark Mirror because they were putting them under pressure. But it just, there's so many contrasts. And another contrast in the Ryder Cup is we're all self-managed. So if I decide to practice on Monday, I practice. If I want to have a rest on Tuesday, I rest. If I want to do eight hours on Wednesday, that's what I do. Not at the Ryder Cup. You're given a schedule when you arrive. This is when you're doing media. This is when you're going to go to this cocktail reception. So you, 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 might, you might play, a, like Tiger Woods, he didn't have a great Ryder Cup experience as early on. Tiger plays his practice rounds normally at 5.30 in the morning and it's finished by 9 a.m. In the Ryder Cup, you're given a tea time and you might start at 9.30 and you're on the golf course for five and a half hours. Completely different to his normal life. I've, I've, then you're finished at three o'clock and you're like, okay, I want to, I didn't play so well. I want to go and practice. No, we've got to be in the team bus at four o'clock, suiting and booting to go to the gala function. You go, well, I, I want to get ready for the, one of the biggest tournaments of life. Well, no, you've got to go to the, do the media. You've got to go do this. You've got to do that. So the Ryder Cup is not like, it's so different for the players to what they're used to. Because as I said, we, because we're individuals and, and, a, I will say, we're not great individuals. I think, but the majority of us, excuse me, the majority of us, you know, if you went to a driving range, I, my, my caddy likes to point this out, if anybody knows my caddy on the kick, he I likes know. to point out, yeah, there's 150 players at each tournament and they're all the CEOs of their own company. <laughs> and yet you wouldn't let 150 of us run your company. I can guarantee it. So we're, we're, we're very bad. Unfortunately, as individuals, I just alluded to my own practice at times, we're very bad at managing ourselves, but it's all we know. And at the Ryder Cup, that's a really difficult thing for the, for to, I, I will work very hard. Uh, I know the last Ryder Cup, I advocated, Justin Rose had just won the FedEx Cup. He'd come in and come in off a big high, big buzz. And I advocated strongly that he'd be treated separate and, and, and given a day off, an extra day off and not have to do the practice rounds and, and all that goes with it, purely based on the fact that, look, I, I would understand that there are individuals that we're going to make work as a team rather than try and force everybody into the same uh, same boat. Yeah, it's such a contrast with, you know, with team games. I mean, I, I was um, in 2013 when I was ambassador in London. I, I went to the Irish training camp during the World Cup at that time. I was talking to some of the players and they were telling me that like from the time they were in the academy at 17, until then, and that was like maybe 15 years, they, they had a program every day of what to eat, you know, where to be, what to wear, you know, it was all programmed for them. And, it just, and they, they were kind of wondering, what would they do when they suddenly ended up not playing rugby anymore? They'd have to manage their own lives for themselves. But you're the total opposite. You, you can do your own thing. You, you can practice when you want to and so on. So it is, a, it is a total contrast with the normal team sports, you know, regime that operates. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, my manager, I think, is on this call somewhere listening in, but he, he would, he, we're together now 25 years. And he would tell you it's changed in that time. The younger guys are becoming too dependent as well at times on managers to like, we hear stories of players ringing up from China, ringing their manager in the middle of the night back in the UK, say, or somewhere like that to get the manager to ring the reception because their pillow is too soft. <laughs> okay. So there, there are, there, there, there's Molly Collian for the youngers, but it's more the, it's more what you talked about with the rugby players. It's, managing their practice schedule, their timing, what they're doing, their training, like having somebody, uh, there's been great success. If, if anybody who's big into their golf, they'd know Frankie Molinari won the Open uh, two, three years ago now, just before Shane. And uh, 
he was working with a guy called Dave Allred, who is a performance coach. Uh, Dave Allred w- worked very well, took Luke Donald to world number one. Luke Donald's a fellow Chicago person there. He lives in Chicago. So he took him to world number one and he's a performance coach where he would set out exactly what and where you're going to practice, when you're going to work in the gym and, and take control of that side. And, and it has a lot of benefit because golfers, just I think even Dan, you might have thought the same thing. Golfers tend to practice what they like practicing rather than what they should practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, tell me, um, I mean, one of the things that, that intrigues me is, is how, you know, apart from Jack Nicholas, who dominated golf for so long and Tiger Woods for, for, for a period too, since then, really, no golfer has been able to, you know, exercise that kind of dominance. Is that simply because there's a lot more competition now that, that, that the standard has become so ridiculously high that nobody can do the Tiger Woods, nobody can do the uh, Jack Nicholas trick, no matter how talented they might be? I, I, look, those two are, were exceptional. Uh, Tiger, Tiger really, uh, I, I, I know Jack was, careers last about 20 years, a few years to get into it, 10 years, 10, 13, 14 years of competitive play and a few years out. Tiger, did it in an era where it was getting a, Jack as well had a lot of good competitors but while Jack had a lot of really good competitors he wouldn't have had as many average competitors going down it wasn't as deep nowadays you have some good players no doubt about it, at the top but you have a lot of very good average players you know the depth is a lot stronger so golf unfortunately and it's going to be the biggest problem they have going forward is trying to, most sports you only tune in when you can have a good idea or prediction of who's going to win or who's going to compete. Uh, and that's an issue with golf. If you turn into the golf on a Sunday and you don't know the names on the leaderboard, you're going to turn it off. So like a perfect example, Dan said I used to go out to Malaysia. So whenever you see a professional golfer go to somewhere strange, okay, they're getting an appearance fee to go there. So you're being paid to go. So Part of the issue, I get paid to go to Malaysia. So they put me on the billboards from the airport to the golf course. They put me on flags. They they parade me around. I do interviews before I get there, when I get there in the local newspapers. So any person who's not into golf but is coming to the golf, they're going to look at the golf and they go, what names? I don't know these names. Oh, I've seen his name in a billboard. So I'm being paid to be there, and not to win the tournament, but I better be in contention on Sunday because the, the half fans who turn up, they want to know somebody. Oh, I saw him on the lead. I saw him being promoted. I'm going to watch him. Yes, he, I don't. It, the ideal story is the local lad actually beats me, but I'm there. So, and they have a problem with golf going forward. If they can't predict who's going to be in contention. And unfortunately, as the depth gets stronger and stronger, they can't do this. And, and if, I'm not promoting anything like Super Leagues or things like that. But ultimately, Super Leagues, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to control the narrative of who's going to win. So I de- if, you know, if we were all going to make the most money out of golf as a professional golfer, we would run it like WWE and Tiger Woods would win or nearly win every week because we know that gets the most viewers and we'd all piggyback on it. But golf is not like that. And unfortunately, unlike the tennis or something, or the or Formula One, a hundred and fiftieth guy can win in a tournament, and nobody know who he is. And not alone can he win; the following week, he doesn't back it up, so he can't, they don't get the story out of it. So it, it's a tough, it is a tough one. You're better off being a big fish in a small market. So Europe has a little bit better a job that its best players generally are going to win or be there. The US, because of the international influx and their own their own players, it's so deep. Calling who's going to win a tournament is like, uh, I certainly can't do it. Uh, so that's, that's, that's definitely one issue that the professional golf is going to have to deal with. How do we make sure that the, that the, the right promotion, right winners? And it's very hard if it's random. Can I, can I just ask, uh, talk about golf in Ireland? Because um, a lot of people on this call and people will be watching this afterwards and when we put the recording up, will be people that maybe would be interested in, in going to Ireland if they haven't been already. In fact, a lot, a lot of American golfers that I meet have been to Ireland many times, but they're all looking to go back again because it's on, you know, they, they have a list of golf clubs they want to play. I mean, 
we have 400 plus golf courses in Ireland. And I mean, they're all wonderful. I mean, I always tell Americans, look, you don't have to go to, you know, to the really expensive ones. You can go to any golf club in Ireland and you'll be very well welcomed and it'll be a great experience. And, you know, the club has afterwards, people will be friendly and, and so on, you know. But have you any, have you any favorite? Uh, is, is that not true? It's certainly true in any golf course. No, I no, no. Maybe they're I afraid like, to be like, nasty to me. I don't know. <laughs> I, I like to explain to people, you know, when they say Irish people are so friendly, that can also be talk, uh, t- taken as nosy. <laughs> they want to know everything about you. <laughs> what part of America would you be from? And would you have to know my cousin in Chicago who moved over there 30 years ago, yeah? But, yeah, but look, yeah. So, so tell me, I mean, I mean, give us a few kind of, you know, recommendations I, 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 of courses you would want to play if you were an American going to Ireland for the first time. I obviously get asked this quite a lot. So yeah. I, I basically say, look, depends on the, what trip you're looking for. If you are really looking for... That, that stereotypical trip of, of, you know, horse and carts and leprechauns. We produce a few leprechauns and things like that. You know, you would hit head to the southwest of Ireland. It's very much set up for tourism. You know, you go to Ring of Kerry. The golf courses are all fantastic down there. Everything is set up. You go to Killarney. Everything is about the tourism. It's all there. If you're looking for a bit more of rugged Ireland, what maybe what, you know, you know what you you think it should be like you go to northwest of ireland it's really unspoiled it's 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 just a you know you do that atlantic way off all the way up the west coast but you get up to that northwest it, it's just beautiful it's stark scenery it's it can be barren at times but it's it's very raw it's very natural ireland and not not anywhere near as uh, as you know there wouldn't be the infrastructure up there like there would be in the southwest uh, Again, fantastic golf courses. You know, if you're down the southwest, you've got your you got your your Waterville's, you've got your Lahinches, you've got your your Bally Bunions, brilliant golf courses up the northwest, you've got your Sligos, your Connemara's, you've got all the way up to Bally Lift. And look, great links golf course. I would be with you, Dan, that I would say to you, you know, there's some fantastic hotels. Like you won't go past like you know, the likes of Adair Manor, you just can't you won't get a better hotel if you want to go down that road unbelievable golf course. you can have the luxury if you're doing it on a budget and you know b&b's airbnb b&b's especially you know the difference with an airbnb in ireland you know you go to an airbnb in ireland airbnb or not an airbnb a b&b in ireland and the lady of the house and he would say you know uh you what time's breakfast she said well what time are you getting up at? and she'll serve you breakfast you know she's not saying you've got to be a and you come in from the pub at 11 30 at night and you'd be going, you're tired, you're jet lagged, and you want to go to bed. But no, she's going to make you tea and sandwiches and start asking you questions. But that's that's an experience in Ireland that, that I don't think you can get anywhere in the world, the bed and breakfast, that sort of thing. The yeah. hotels are luxurious, great. Those two are, are, are great. West and the, if you're bringing, you know, if you're bringing a partner who's not into golf, you know, Dublin is great. There's, you can stay in Dublin. You've got all the great restaurants. You've got, you've got a nightlife in Dublin and you've got all the tourist attractions. You know, there's all out of, with the golf courses within about 45 minutes of the center of the city. So if you're, you know, you, you don't have to, you, you don't have to alienate somebody you're bringing with you. You know, you don't have to go there and go, I'm going playing golf. The Southwest, as I said, you will do the Blarney Stone and stuff like that. It's, you know, as an Irish person, we kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's all the tourism. Dublin is just the city yeah. where I come from. It's a European city. It's got everything. It's got the tourism. It's got the whole buzz about it. And definitely people who have no interest in golf will enjoy Dublin where you can. You, I think it's all definitely overlooked in terms of a golfing destination, Dublin. You have the K Club just outside the city if you want, you know, the Ryder Cup venue. Yeah, Drew is one of my favourites. Uh, Drew is yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also European the European is a great course as well. Yeah. Uh, the them. island, Port Mark, and on all golf courses in Ireland. The great thing about golf courses in Ireland, even though they're members' golf courses, they'll all take a green. Thing. So really? you know, you, you ring up and, and get it, get it organised. Uh, you could go up that north way, up up to Northern Ireland, up the up the east coast. Uh, tends to be more golf related going up. You could go and play in County Down, Port Rush, play Baltray on the way up. So you, you have some lovely places. Southwest of Ireland, you know, you're heading down to Ward- Waterford and places like that is the warmest part of our country, the sunniest part of our country. That's what I always say, the sunniest yeah. southeast. It's always yeah. a half degree warmer than Dublin. Yeah, sunny southeast, and it, it's 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 the it, you know it really is horticulturally wise, and it's the 
probably the most beautiful part of the country, but not as stark as the West, uh, as you can say. So th that I think that covers everything. I, 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 each little section, the one thing I would say, be wary of driving distances in Ireland. So th the idea in America, you can get in a car and drive the whole, you know, it takes a while to drive from A to B in Ireland. So don't be, don't, I, I see people playing too many rounds of golf. So they, they think they can play a new course every day or something like that. And it just puts a lot of stress on you. If you have to drive to each venue overnight, you're better off staying in one venue and playing maybe four or five golf courses from that venue unless you are genuinely into your driving and want to do the whole of the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic way. Corey, because there are golfers on the, uh, the call and people who will be going out this weekend to hit the ball um, around the place, um, I, I'm going to ask you to give us, to give, us, give us a tip for driving and a tip for putting, okay? Just one, <sighs> uh, just one tip. We're not expecting you to transform our game, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to give, me, give us one tip for my benefit and the benefit of those who are watching, okay? Okay, so I put it... First. I have put everything I know up on Instagram, which is all on my webpage, portrackharrington.com. It's going on YouTube. It's on Twitter. So it's all there if you're interested and you want to look at it. Sure. The one tip I would give for driving is two tips. As always, I don't do things. So for majority of golfers, the golf swing should be led by the hands and arms and not the body and legs. Okay? So elite players, they work on shoulder. Shoulder turn is adding nothing to you guys. Nothing at all. All that stuff is rubbish. Play golf with your hands and arms, okay? Let them lead everything and you'll be a better player. And the second thing I would say, and this is more specific to driving, actually every golf shot will improve. It's the only thing I can actually say to every person without looking at the golf swing that will improve their game without ever doing them harm. Because no matter what I say to you, so golf is kind of like a ticking, a ticking, you know, a, a pendulum. If you start doing one thing too much, it would go, you have to bring it back. You kind of have to keep correcting until it eventually gets a little bit like that. But this one thing I could say to everybody, it will improve your game. It will never do you harm. You can work on it for the rest of your life and yet you won't do it. Okay? And that is hold your finish on every shot. Chip, put, drive, iron shot. If you pose and pose like somebody was taking a picture after you hit it, to be able to pose after you hit it, you've got to have moved properly to get there. So you, you, if you try, if you try to, like the worst things you can do in golf is keep your head down, keep your head still, swing slowly. They're all rubbish, counterproductive. If you finish your golf swing up there posed, the only way you can get there is to move properly. You can't get to that position unless you move properly. So if you concentrate on every day on getting to that position, you'll be a better you'll be better and gradually improve everything all the way through. So posing at the end, if necessary, imagine somebody was going to take your photograph. If you get to that position, what goes before has to work properly because you can't, you can't really. So you'll find majority of people, a shorter backswing and a longer follow through is far better. L long backswing does not give you more speed. So a shorter backswing, aggressive through the ball with a big follow through, uh, so they, these are the sort of things that generally amateurs get wrong. Use your hands and arms. And I'm putting, you know, putting is pretty straightforward. Just tap the ball. Don't think of necessary. I don't think you're better off with a putt thinking, tapping it rather than thinking stroke. If you tap it, you'll have more aggression in your putt. And that's a great way if you've got a putt uphill that you want to get to the hole. So most people, when they're putting up a hill, they go, right, I want to get it to the hole. And they go, take a bigger stroke, and all of a sudden they think they're going to hit it too hard, and they quit. Whereas if you try and stop at impact, you'll actually hit the ball harder. So the next time you have a putt that you want to get, you want to get up a hill or into the wind, just say to yourself, I'm going to stop at impact. And by stopping at impact, you'll actually accelerate a bit more into the ball and hit it. So that, that, that you know, I think anything else, they're all there. Everything I know, okay. uh, I, I tell you my most popular tip on putting, was if you want to lag a putt, you've got to go way higher than you think because it's about a factor. It, amateurs on the read by a factor of three, but if you miss a putt, say you hit the putt at the same pace and you miss it a foot high or a foot low, the one that misses a foot low will go three times the distance away from the hole than the one that misses a foot high. 
So if you're if you're trying to get the ball close, always go higher than you think. Right. If you feel uncomfortable standing over a putt, you've never given it and you've never you haven't gone high enough with the break. These are all I I leave it with you because they're they're all on Instagram, YouTube. You know, all uh, there. when I when I got my lessons, I remember at the Royal Sanango Golf Club, which you've played in, in Kuala Lumpur, and, and and the coach there had all the video stuff. I mean, it was very advanced. And and he asked me, which player would you like to play? Like I said, Porrick Harrington. So he taught me your swing. So there you are. So whatever I whatever I do, it's a it's some kind of a, a pale reflection of you, Porrick. Okay. okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm I, I'm I'm worried now. You're off eighteen. I don't know what you're telling me. <laughs> Anyway, I will. Um, I, I, before you, I will say, if you're a beginner, and it, uh, hopefully there's some people here who've never played golf and they're going to play golf. There's three things you've got to do to play golf. You've got to make an athletic swing. So whatever makes you move and swing that stick as fast as you can. Then you've got to learn where the club face is by exaggerating open and close. Just keep working on a hitting golf ball, short shots, and then you just have to experience. So the three things are separate. Whereas most people. They start off, they try and do all of them together and all of a sudden they make compromises and they never get going. So swing the club as hard as you can, learn where that face is in relation to your hands and then just get out on the golf course and, and, and just get experience. So I, think, I think this is a final or maybe a second last question. Um, um, someone has asked on the Q&A about golf and the pandemic and I was going to ask actually about how you think golf may be changed by the pandemic because a lot of the clubs in, in, in Washington now where, where I go as a guest they're not having guests anymore because there's such a demand from the members that the tea times are full, whereas normally there'd, there'd be plenty of scope for, for bringing guests to the clubs. So um, I think the question was, like, how has the pandemic affected your golf? Uh, and how do you? Th and I, my question would be, how do you think the pandemic will affect golf going forward? Well, it's, uh, clearly it's been great for golf and, and it proves the old adage, well, no, not the old adage, my adage when it comes to golf. So most people think golf is a rich person sport. Golf is, you have to have you have to be time rich to play golf. Yeah. That's the only requirement. It's pretty cheap to play golf here in Ireland. My kids join the local club for 100 quid. So yeah. it's a cheap game. You can, everything is there secondhand if you want it. So yeah, you've got to have lots of time. And in the pandemic, people have more time. So that's why they're playing golf. The trick for golf is they're going to have to figure out how to keep these people when life gets busy again. Because yeah. it's very hard for somebody, again, who's working 60, 70 hours a week to leave their partner on a Saturday for, and say, I'm going off for six hours, see you later, you, you keep the kids sort of thing. You know, that's just not going to happen. So uh, that, the, the biggest issue with golf is from that 30 years of age to 45, where people are busy with life, they just don't have time for golf. And, and we, as golf, we need to speed up how quick you play. We've got to get the attitude that it's okay to go play six holes or nine holes. You don't need to play. I, I personally, when I go playing golf with my friends, I like to pl play about 14 holes because it gives me enough time to get there early, have a breakfast sandwich with, the, with, with my mates, play it around, and then come in and have a drink afterwards. I wouldn't want to go play social golf unless I had those two experiences before and after. It's not about, it's not about the golf for me. It's about the... the and and be, being on the course four and a half, five hours is way too long. Uh, so that's certainly something that golf needs to improve and make that experience... Cause, it's the crack you have afterwards with your with your mates. Yeah, is the thing. As regards, uh, no, I think that was was the, was the second part of that. I forgot. Yeah, no, no. Well, well, it was. I think and the question from from the, from the Q and A was like, how has how has the pandemic changed your kind of golfing life? <laughs> I, I've got I've got an indoor golf simulator here, and I've got I've got golf holes around my house. I yeah. I, I'm, I I it's like I built a house for the pandemic. They're right. like, yeah, yeah, it's like I knew this. I wish I knew it was coming. Well, I don't wish I knew it was coming, obviously, but it, it, it's like I knew this was coming. I've built a house. So it has an impact. It, it was, there's trouble with travel. And I've been, I was in the States for 80 days because I couldn't go home. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm off home now for five weeks because I can't go back and forth. And then I'm away for three months. So it, it's, it means you go for big blocks of time because you can't, you know, with the two weeks quarantine and uh, on the way home. So travel has been different, and and obviously it'd be a lot easier once we get the, uh, a vaccine. Even though I've had COVID, I, I get a vaccine now just to make my life easier with traveling. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, look, it it was difficult like for us all at the start, but the tours, especially in the European tour, wow, did they create some bubble around their events? Like you go into this bubble and you do not 
Like it is like it's not far off putting a bubble around us. Like it was impressive. No, nobody outside of our group who's not tested can get in and, it, it, and nobody can leave. It was unbelievable. So yeah, look, it, 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 it's not great. It's different. It's weird. It's strange. It's it, the, the two professional tours have done brilliant. We've had opportunity, uh, but we're all, we're all seeing the, hopefully all seeing the light at the end of the tunnel now. Yeah. And I mean, if I pay to you that you never, you never decided to take the option of living in Florida or Georgia or somewhere like that. I mean, you, you actually stuck with uh, uh, living in Dublin. That's so you, uh, you're like you too. You didn't kind of take the, the kind of, uh, you know, the road to, you know, to a life outside of Ireland. You've actually stuck with me, Dublin. Me, well me and my two kids would be okay. All right. In the States, but for a happy life. And, and I've seen this. So golfers tend to move with their family to say Florida or Arizona would be the two, two big places. And then the player relocates there and then he goes off and plays tournaments and leaves his his partner at home yeah and the partner's at home going well what am i doing here i don't have any friends so my wife she's from this area in dublin well, so, I and from, from yeah the days, yeah, but, it? yeah now that we like, okay early on she traveled full time now she doesn't travel but if i had her in florida and i left her there to go to an event she'd have no like she wouldn't have her family or infrastructure here yeah. I'm home now for five weeks and I can tell you after five weeks, I'll get booted out the door. <laughs> As in, I, I am ruining the routines, you know, the different things that are going on. Like, it, 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 you know, so I think for a sports person, or a businessman, business person traveling, it's very important that whoever you leave behind, they have the structure that they're, that they're comfortable in that environment rather than, you know, my wife has her sister, her mother and friends all here. So it, 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 her life is not dependent on my life being away. So it, it, it really does help for, for uh, I've seen it with a lot, a lot of professional golfers who get divorced. It's because they all moved rather than uh, maybe sticking from where they're, 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 they're partners from. Well, that's a great note on which to finish, Borg. And it's really been a great pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> I look forward to hopefully being at the Ryder Cup and maybe um, seeing you there. Um, but in the meantime, you know, good luck in your preparations uh, for the Ryder Cup. And it'd be great to see a, see a European victory on American soil again, led by an Irishman. That would be a real treat for everyone. And now yes. I hand back to uh, Kevin Byrne, who's going to say, uh, say a few words to, to, to send us on our way. Kevin, yeah, uh, you. You. it's your tea off time. <laughs> thank you ambassador and and thanks Podrick. look that was just a, a phenomenal way for everyone to to start their day and um, really insightful uh and inspiring words there um Podrick, you mentioned uh for for folks that aren't golfers um i definitely fit into that, that category i play golf uh, once a year with my dad uh he's quite a good golfer i'm i'm definitely not um but uh, I'll, I'll get great satisfaction now when i get out onto the green for the first time and say Dad, poor Carrington taught me this, you know, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I, I, I might not mention there were another 40 or 50 people uh, on, on the call, but um, look, we really appreciate uh, your time and for, for sharing um, all of that. Really, really fascinating. Um, we uh, in the concert hope you might join us uh, next week. We've got an event. We are uh, unveiling uh, a portrait uh, of one of our um, Irish diaspora community members who, who made a huge contribution, uh, Mother Joan. So we'll, we'll post about that. Um, but just, Podrick, thank you so much for your time. Very best of luck uh, in September. Uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, and everyone, thank you for, for joining us this, this morning.